Hi, everyone. Um, so we are here to round out our day and what a day it's been. Thank you all so much for being a part of it. This is our final session. This is a hot topic. It's my honor to introduce our closing plenary speaker today, my colleague, Dr. Shahid Ahmed. Dr. Ahmed attended medical college at Aga Khan University. He did his residency, chief residency and fellowship at Indiana University. Dr. Ahmed served as assistant professor at University of Vermont through 2024. He broke our heart and left, I'm kidding. Um, and he's currently an assistant professor at Emory University. We miss him terribly. His clinical interest in GU, is in GU cancer and immuno-oncology, and his research focuses on the microbiome. Welcome back, Dr. Ahmed. It's great to be back, Molly. Thank you so much for having me back uh, so soon after I had left. So the wounds are still fresh, <laughs> and, uh, but it's good to be back. Uh, so today we'll be talking about the microbiome, which is a very uh, hot topic right now. It's very close to my heart uh, for sure. Um, I have no disclosures. We'll be kind of talking about a few things here. We'll be talking about how the microbiome is related to health in general. And then also, how can we modulate the microbiome to improve our health? And at the end, we'll also talk a little bit about what the future looks like with the microbiome, which is very exciting. So depending on the time of the day, sometimes we're more microbe than humans, and sometimes we're more human. And I think, you know, after having a good coffee in the morning and then going to the restroom, I'm probably uh, more human. I feel more human afterwards. Um, <laughs> So can anybody here guess how many cells are in our body? Just the ballpark. Okay, so did I uh, hear a billion? A trillion, how many trillion? Three, okay, we have about 37 trillion cells in our body. And can you guess how many microbes we have on our body? More, absolutely, that's the answer. So about 40 to 50, you know, uh, million, uh, trillion microbes in our body. Now, um, that's only talking about the bacteria. There's also viruses, there's fungi, there's parasites. So there's all kinds of critters in, uh, living within us. And most of these are friendly bacteria. Um, most of these have, have, have a very uh, commensal role uh, in our body where they um, work towards uh, maintaining health, um, improving our immune system, improving, you know, uh, surveillance for cancers. Um, it can even impact your, uh, your brain and how you react to things and um, levels of anxiety and whatnot. There's a whole lot of research going on in that field right now. So bacteria play a huge role in our, uh, in our body. And of course, you know, they're, they're the predominant uh, thing. So we're more microbe than human. Now, when we think of bacteria, we think that they're mostly in the gut, right? Uh, but that's not true. Bacteria are everywhere. Uh, there's bacteria um, within our pancreas, our gallbladders, um, our brains, which, you know, really was mind-blowing for me when I thought, I, I do not want any bacteria in my brain. <laughs> Uh, but they are there. And the reason that we didn't know this for the longest time was because when we try to find bacteria, we put them on these petri dishes and we put some nutrients in there. And you know, sometimes bacteria grow and sometimes they don't. And if you don't have the right nutrients, they might not grow. But now we have these new techniques where we're just looking at the DNA of these bacteria. So these dead bacteria have remnants of DNA that are floating around, and we know now what their uh, DNA looks like. So when we sequence them, um, in, we sequence an organ or um, sequence uh, you know, some, uh, some cells, we're able to see the DNA remnants of these. So with these newer techniques, we're able to see bacteria in multiple places. Um, bacteria have now been found in um, carotid plaques, in, in different cancers, and we're trying to understand how they're implicated in those roles. Now, um, just, you know, uh, 
talking about the location of these bacteria. So there are various different microbiomes within our body. There's the gut microbiome, which is obviously the most popular, but then there's a microbiome on your skin, there's uh, a microbiome within the urine itself, and um, you know, they, they vary from place to place. So the composition of these bacteria is different in different places of the body, depending on you know, what, the, what the microenvironment looks like. Um, you know, I moved to Atlanta. Um, and that was, you know, uh, a microbial move for me. You could think of it in that way, and because of certain, you know, reasons. And so, um, similar to that, I think that, um, you know, there's uh, there's certain bacteria that can flourish in particular environments, but not in others. So that's why, because those environments are slightly different, your armpits are different from, you know, uh, your eyebrows. And so that's why the bacteria in those two places can be different. Um, so today I'm going to talk mostly about the gut microbiome, which has been the mostly studied. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about the uh, urine microbiome, um, which is uh, what my research is in. Um, so bacteria living in the gut are incredibly diverse, um, and this diversity is what keeps our immune system healthy. So you can think of it in a way that, you know, if, there's, if you're in a large city, you're living in a large city where the police department is exposed to multiple different kinds of diverse, you know, um, criminals, for example. They're good and they're, they've been exposed to everything. So they're good at picking out threats, whereas in a smaller city that might not be possible. So this is the example that I give to my patients all the time, is that for a diverse, uh, that if you have a diverse microbiome, you're going to have a diverse immune system. And how do you make a diverse microbiome? Well, we're going to talk about that. And that's mostly through feeding that microbiome a diverse diet. Now, um, uh, you know, as an example here on the right here, um, this is a study where they reset the immune systems of people with, uh, who are going through stem cell transplant. So in stem cell transplant, you give them very high doses of chemotherapy, and their immune system is obliterated. And then you replenish the immune system again. It regrows again, and you're born again. Now, in this study, they show that people who, when the immune system grew back, if they had more diverse immune system coming back, um, they lived longer. They did better. And so this was one of the first studies where we under, were we, you know, that was mind-blowing at first that bacteria um, living in our body could change the outcomes of a stem cell transplant. So after that, there have been many landmark studies. Um, the one on the left here, you can see, um, this is a particular bacteria that um, improves the chances of one of our immune drugs working. So cancer cells live in our body all the time, and our immune system just deals with them. But as we get older, immune cells can become exhausted. And so we have new drugs that can boost the immune system to fight cancer. Um, it seems that if you have particular bacteria in the body, that your immune system would work better when you get an immunotherapy like that. So that was another mind-blowing you know, revelation um, that our drugs could work better or worse, depending on the microbial uh, complexity in our body. Um, similarly, there's another um, immune drug here on the right side, um, which, you know, in this study, they had some germ-free mice which had no microbiome. In that study, the drug didn't work, whereas in the part of, uh, part of the mice that um, had a microbiome, the, the drugs worked better. Moving this research along, the next step was trying to see, well, could we modify the microbiome? And so uh, they took mice where immunotherapy was working and used their stool, their microbiome, and transplanted it into other mice where the immunotherapy wasn't working. And lo and behold, the checkpoint inhibitors, our immune treatments, started working for those. And so they went on to do the first in human studies um, a few years ago where um, about 15 patients got um, fecal transplants from people where immunotherapy had worked. They had taken their microbiome and given that fecal transplant into somebody um, where the immunotherapy wasn't working. 
And lo and behold, half of those people started responding after that fecal transplant. So that was you know, one of the first studies, very exciting study um, that showed us the power of the microbiome and how we could harness it. Now, um, when I talk about fecal transplant, it's pills. Uh, where, yeah, so it doesn't sound, uh, you know, it, doesn't, it isn't like it sounds like. <laughs> so by the end of this talk, I'm sure a lot of us are gonna lose our appetites. Uh, <laughs> after that, there have been numerous studies where they've uh, looked at the gut microbiome and response to immunotherapy. Um, you know, different people with different bacteria seem to have, uh, so you could predict whether or not you're going to respond to immunotherapy based on the microbial um, uh, data before. Another interesting thing is, well, how quickly can you change the microbiome? And the answer came from this study where they took African Americans and gave them an African diet and then gave some Africans an American diet. And their, uh, their, their microbiome switched in about two weeks' time. So you could change the microbiome pretty quickly. You know? Now, there is a unique set of microbiome for all of us. All individuals have a unique microbiome that may not, that, that's more stable than not. But there's a part of the microbiome that, is, that can be changed with diet. The part that's stable is mostly because of genetics and our early exposures in life. So um, to understand whether you know, um, uh, these, these diets, can, can they improve our immune therapy responses, um, there is this study going on right now um, where they're giving patients a high fiber diet to improve their microbiome. And then they're getting immunotherapy for cancer, for melanoma. And this study is gonna result in 2026. And then we're gonna find out um, whether uh, a high fiber diet should be recommended um, when somebody's starting immunotherapy for melanoma. So, um, yeah, now we'll move on um, to the urine a little bit, talk a little bit about that. Um, urine, for the most part, was thought to be sterile, right? I think back in 1881, there was this report that came out that, you know, we can't grow anything out of the urine, it must be sterile, there's nothing in it. Um, but since 2014, they've shown that there is a healthy microbiome within the uh, urine. And again, it was done by that same technique where um, you, you do the DNA testing to kind of see if there are remains of, it's kind of like a forensic, you're running forensics on the urine to see if there's you know, bacteria that died there. Um, and so um, there, there's a, uh, the numbers of the microbiome are much lesser in the, in the urine. That's why it's so hard to culture the urine, but uh, compared to the gut, but they are, they are there. And it's got, a, you know, it, it's got several roles to play in there. It forms uh, an immune barrier. It helps the immune system work better. Um, it interestingly metabolizes certain carcinogens. So for example, if somebody's smoking and uh, they've got toxins that are being um, excreted through the urine. There are bacteria that grow within the urine, and they can, um, you know, metabolize those toxins so that your chance of developing cancer there is lesser. So um, th there's there's certainly a lot of healthy roles for bacteria there. So just four years ago, we were able to show that the bacteria living in the bladder is different from the bacteria living in healthy cells. Um, this is an interesting study that came out of Africa um, where there is a disease called schistosomiasis. So it's a parasite that uh, infects people's bladders and then, you know, those patients can develop bladder cancer. But that parasite's everywhere. So the question was, why doesn't everybody get bladder cancer? And the answer came in the form that there are some people who have a healthy microbiome in the urine and they were able to process all the you know, toxins that were being produced by the schistosoma and therefore they were not getting bladder cancer. But the people who did get bladder cancer, their microbiome was different and they could not process the toxins produced by the schistosoma. So, um, and, and then since then, you know, there have been countless studies uh, within the urine world as well, 
um, showing that you know, there are these bacteria that we find more so in people when they're smoking or they're exposed to toxins. And these bacteria that are listed here, they're trying to um, reduce the, the amount of toxins uh, or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, bacteria in the urine um, also have a role to play with um, treatments in the bladder, so we use this treatment in the bladder called BCG, which does anybody know here what BCG is, or did anybody get a BCG shot ever? Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a vaccine against tuberculosis that used to be given um, you know, 50 years ago, 30 years ago. It's still given in some parts. I have a scar because I'm from Pakistan, so they get, everybody gets it over there. Um, but this treatment is nice because you could, so this vaccine is one of the first vaccines that was used to treat bladder cancer. You would inject the vaccine into people's bladder and, uh, you know, the immune system would wake up and say, oh, I think there's TB there. So it would go there and, and try to fix the TB, but find cancer instead and then start fighting the cancer. So that's how BCG works. And we have now, you know, shown that people... Um, who respond to BCG and those who don't respond to BCG, um, they have different microbiomes. And we think that certain bacteria are protecting, um, uh, you know, the, the body from, um, from uh, uh, developing cancer. So there are these friendly bugs. The biggest one of them is lactobacillus. Um, lactobacillus is a bacteria that's found in a lot of um, uh, you know, yogurt-based stu stuff. It's also predominantly found in, in females compared to males. Um, and uh, you know, it produces this, um, this toxin called lactate, which reduces all the bad bugs, essentially. And so by reducing all the bad bugs, it's kind of keeping the body safe. So it's a, it's a protector. And um, there's a lot of research going on with lactobacillus in trying to you know, reduce the risk of bladder cancer um, and, and, and to improve the effectiveness of our BCG treatments. So here's a study where um, they took 82,000 Swedish people and um, they gave them a questionnaire and they you know, assessed their risk for bladder cancer over the next 10 years. And of all the people who developed bladder cancer, compared to the people who did not get bladder cancer, they were able to show that the people who were not getting bladder cancer were maybe consuming more um, cultured milk or sour milk and yogurt and fermented yogurt. Um, that is rich in lactobacillus. And so we think that that's probably the lactobacillus there that's uh, leading to the reduced risk of bladder cancer. Um, bladder cancer is three times more common in men compared to women. And so we also think that we wonder that maybe it's because, you know, one of the reasons it could be is because women have more lactobacillus owing to their um, slightly different um, flora. So this is just a summary here showing that on the left side here, on the bottom side here, um, any, all the lines that are um, towards the left of this strong line the, uh, are showing benefit of fermented dairy food products um, compared to uh, it, when you think about bladder cancer risk. Okay, so how do we improve our, our, our microbiome? How do we make it better? Well, there are certain things that we know that we can do, and then there are certain things that we should avoid. So first and foremost, I think if you want a diverse microbiome, you want to feed it a, di a diverse diet. So we say that you, know, you should have at least 30 or more different types of foods within a week. You should be consuming that. There's this Hazda tribe in Africa that has been shown to have the best, most diverse microbiome in the entire world. And they, because they're hunter-gatherers, they're exposed to almost 600 different species of fruits, vegetables, and animals that they hunt. Um, whereas an average American is, uh, you know, exposed to maybe 50. So our, our diets are not very diverse. But how can you get diversity within your diet? It's, it's, you know, it's not as hard as you think. If you got a salad and you put 10 things in it, that's 10 different types of foods. So you, it's, you know, um, so berries. If you have berries 
raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, they're all different types of foods there. Um, so you would count that as three. So if you have more, 30 or more uh, fruits and vegetables um, or different types of foods, and that would include nuts, legumes, beans, all those kind of things, um, that's, that seems to be helpful in improving diversity of the diet. The other thing that can, um, uh, that can help is beans. I love beans. I think all my patients know that I love beans, and they better love beans. <laughs> so beans are kind of sticky, and it gives a surface for these bacteria to grow in the body. That's why it's smelly afterwards. Um, but that's the bacteria there were doing their job. And so um, beans seem, and so you, it could be any kind of beans, you know. Um, it could, even coffee beans, you know. Any kind of beans are good, are good for you. Um, similar to that, we talked a little bit about fermented stuff. So, you know, kefir, uh, kimchi, you know, all that sauerkraut, all that stuff, that's good. It can in improve the diversity of the microbiome. Um, and so that, those are some of the big things in terms of what you could do to improve um, your microbiome. I think I'm missing out one. Uh, yeah, the biggest one, which is fiber. So um, fiber is broken down by bacteria. And so if it's insoluble fiber, it's of no nutritious value to you, but those bacteria consume it and break it down. And when it breaks it down, it produces short-chain fatty acids, and those are very good for the immune system. And also, it helps regulate the bowels quite well. So um, the recommended amount of fiber is about 40 grams a day, and our average consumption is only 16 grams. So that's, you know, you can see that there's a huge difference there between the fiber intake of Americans compared to the rest of the world. So that's certainly something that we all need to work on, including myself. Um, so those are things that we can do to improve our microbiome. Uh, then there are things that we should avoid so that, you know, uh, we don't end up uh, uh, destroying our microbiome. The biggest one of these is processed foods and refined sugars. These uh, refined sugars and processed foods, you know, remember, they're all going to be broken down by these bacteria. And so if these bacteria are, you know, uh, are utilizing these refined sugars, it messes up with their metabolism and their growth patterns. And so that seems to be correlated with obesity and a lot of diseases and inflammation rather than you know, a protective role. Um, alcohol kind of sterilizes a lot of bugs. So you, know, you want to reduce the amount of alcohol intake. Um, Over-the-counter probiotics you could think of them as, well, we all think, well, let's all just take probiotics, right? But I think that the problem with probiotics is that you're introducing um, foreign species of bacteria to your gut. And then they can dominate the, re the resident you know, uh, bacteria there. And so that's not a good thing. And so you want to really grow your own microbiome. Through, through diet rather than trying over-the-counter probiotics. Now, if you had a probiotic, you know, there's probiotics in fermented stuff, and that's totally fine. That's, that's, that's what we're looking for here. Antibiotics. Um, so, of course, we all sometimes do need antibiotics, and in the right circumstances, we do need to use antibiotics. But I think that using them prudently is the way to go. And also, when you're taking antibiotics, to have some fermented you know, yogurt with that or, or some other form of uh, replenishment of the microbiome um, when you're on antibiotics. Finally, you know, there is this, uh, you know, there's a paper just published in Nature about stress and the microbiome. And that just blew my mind again. What's going on here is that stress um, will cause your vagus nerve to secrete certain hormones into the, into the stomach, and that changes the microbial you know, um, inlay of, of the gut. And in turn, those, those microbes in the gut, they can also produce serotonin and dopamine, these you know, neurotransmitters that affect the brain. So there's this bi-directional axis uh, where the brain is affecting the microbiome in the gut, and the guts, you know, the gut microbiome is affecting the brain. 
Um, so people with depression, with anxiety, they've been shown to have separate microbiomes, and you know, changing these microbiomes has, uh, seems to help with those things too. And so th this is a new field of research and a lot going on in there. And, but it's just fascinating to kind of, you know, uh, uh, that, you know, your, your diet actually, uh, you are what you eat. And, uh, you know, that there, you know, all these things that we had thought before were true um, when we didn't know about any of these things um, are actually might be true. You know, there's, there's uh, um, certainly that wisdom that's been passed on. Um, and then finally, maybe, you know, we need, don't need to obsess about health hygiene as much. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes we obsess about hygiene and uh, very frequent hand washing, you know, sterilizing all the surfaces and everything else. Maybe it's not the best thing. So when you're, um, you know, when you're living with your partner, um, you're, you know, their microbiome and your microbiome might be very similar. Over time, you share all these things. You know, you're eating the same stuff. Um, there's, you know, there's so much that's happening that's invisible to the eye. And so, um, you know, we know that if, if we made a change in our lives, that it's not only impacting us, but also people living right next to us because that helps change the microbiome. There's, um, um, you know, there's a, a recent study where it showed that if you were living with a leaner person, you know, that your microbiome changes because of that. Um, and so, um, a lot happening in that regard. Okay. The future, I think, is very promising. And um, I think at some point in time, we'll be able to use or modulate these bugs um, as drugs. Um, so there are uh, certainly, you know, we've talked a little bit about the, uh, the microbiome transplant here, um, but there are certainly newer products that are coming out that could potentially improve your microbiome uh, for particular reasons. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then, you know, designing better prebiotics and probiotics, and then, uh, you know, those that can help um, rather than hurt. Um, and then, you know, there are going to be some drugs that are probably going to target how these bacteria are playing a role. So remember, we have about 20,000 genes in our body, and, uh, you know, that's just our genes. All, all the genes are the same in all the cells, right? But then we've got trillions of different bacteria with different genes in us as well. So that's the, that's the microbial genome. And so we're really dealing with a, you know, a vast, uh, uh, a huge variety of genomic options. And so I think that uh, n not, you know, uh, not keeping that in mind um, and only thinking about our genes when we're studying these things, when we're coming up with new treatments, it's going to be very important to keep the microbiome um, uh, within picture. So as an example, this is the first example um, that just came out uh, a couple of years back of this product called CBM588. Previously, I showed you that this bacteria called bifidobacterium, um, it improves the effectiveness of one of our immunotherapy drugs in cancer. And so in order to increase that bacteria, they came up with a prebiotic that's called CBM588. And so they were able to give this prebiotic to half the patients with kidney cancer getting immunotherapy. And what we see here is stark that when they got this product, they both had increased bifidobacterium, but also had better responses to the immunotherapy. So this, along with fecal transplants, I think, you know, um, will be um, potentially revolutionizing our field in the future. Um, and then, you know, using the microbiome as a biomarker, we, don't, we still don't know how to do that just yet, but I think in the future, um, we're going to be able to check somebody's microbiome and say, oh, you know, I don't think this drug's going to work for you. Or, you know, maybe, you know, you don't have cancer yet, but this microbiome is telling us that you could potentially get cancer. So we could use it as a screening or a biomarker tool in the future. This is uh, just a, a quick plug on my study. We're uh, looking at the bacterial influence um, uh, in bladder cancer and trying to understand how bladder cancer forms. Um, in, um, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in how their uh, micro microbes are different and how they are interacting with the immune cells. And so here we've, uh, we've taken samples from 
uh, you know, uh, very willing uh, patients who've given samples of their bladder cancer specimens and some urine, and we've been able to do, uh, do testing on that, and this is an ongoing study that uh, I started here, and, you know, hopefully we'll be able to continue at Emory and, you know, collaborate with uh, some of my friends over here. So with that, um, I'm going to stop here. Um, you know, UVM is very, very dear to my heart. Um, so Molly, if you ever call me again, I will definitely come again. Um, uh, UVM is definitely more beautiful. Uh, as you can see, Emory is down there. They're okay, but you know. Um, and so I just want to thank everybody who's been uh, working on my team, my mentor, Stephen Addis, Molly for inviting me, and then you know, the students that have been working with me and the lab that we work with. Um, so thank you. So we'll take any questions. Yes. Yeah. Should I repeat all that? Yeah. Over-the-counter probiotics. Can you please say more about over-the-counter probiotics sure. and why we shouldn't take them? And, and is there evidence that taking over-the-counter probiotics causes bad things to happen in the gut? So <laughs> we know that, you know, so the time scales here are different, right? So proving that over-the-counter probiotics are going to lead to worse health outcomes, it's going to be a 20-year study to kind of find that out. However, what we do know is that over-the-counter probiotics reduce microbial diversity rather than increase it. And so what you're looking for is a diverse microbiome because that, that is what has been shown to be helpful in preventing disease and fighting disease. Um, and so, you know, and, and the reason that we think that over-the-counter probiotics uh, reduces diversity is because you're introducing a foreign bacteria that end up dominating the, the resident microbiome. And so what you really need is you need the, the, the resident population to flourish. You want the, you know, the, the original population to flourish rather than introduce bacteria from the outside. I hope that answers your question. Sure. Yeah. Well, with what? I'm sorry. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so your question was, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question again? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 So I think you know. So the question is, um, just for the audience on Zoom, is that if you um, you know have a reduced uh, microbial diversity, um, but you can't because you have C diff or something like that. By the way, the rates of C diff have gone up because our diversity uh, in the microbiome is going down. What else can you do if you can't eat uh, kimchi or you know, those, those other things? I think you know, fruits and vegetables and diversity in diet. That's all you need. I think everything else is, you know, is uh, icing on the cake. But really, the biggest thing is just having a diverse diet, trying to eat as many different types of things that you can, whatever you can tolerate. Really, that's what, all that there is to it. And then I think the other part is going to be avoiding, um, avoiding the, you know, the other things like the alcohol and those kind of things. So um, that would be the biggest thing. Now, your question was about stem cell transplant and how did they you know, repopulate their microbiome. They did not repopulate their microbiome. They just looked at individuals and just looked at their microbiome after they had the transplant. So then they looked at the microbiome and said, okay, this person's microbiome was more diverse at the end of it compared to this person, and actually this person lived longer 
because their microbiome potentially was more. Yeah, so it was, they, they, they rebuilt it back themselves, you know, but uh, there wasn't any control. At that point, they didn't know, you know, this was a study in 2014, so it's still pretty early on. Yes. We have a question over here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, you referred in passing to societies and cultures that have uh, consume optimal cancer preventive uh, diets. What is the relationship between those countries and longevity and lifespan worldwide? Yeah, so that's a very, very good question. So um, I don't know actually what the, um, I don't know what the, um, what the uh, you know, longevity spans of Hazda people are, who have been shown to have the most diverse um, you know, microbiome. Now they're hunter-gatherers, but there are these blue zones that we all know about, right? And so in these blue zones, there are people who are centenarians who are, who've been living, you know, who have a high proportion of people who live to 100 or more. And um, I think for those people, fruits and vegetables and having a diverse diet, the Mediterranean diet, for example, is a very diverse diet. Um, that is one of the bigger keys there, but then there's several other things as well. Um, you know, living more socially and, and, and uh, you know, walking more, walking more uphill, those kind of things, you know. Um, but I think that um, they have a pretty diverse diet and they don't, uh, you know, the alcohol consumption is limited as well. So maybe that's, you know, got to do with that. Am but I Sweden have a higher life expectancy than Mediterranean countries such as Spain, Portugal, Greece, and Italy? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you, so could you repeat your question because I... Could you give the uh, Mediterranean diet, I'm, and I'm listing a few Mediterranean countries. Yes. Is it not a fact that uh, Northern Europe has a higher life expectancy than those, those uh, celebrated uh, Mediterranean countries? That's right. So there are certain, you know, blue zones outside of that area. And so Japan being one, you know, they have very high, they probably have the highest life expectancies in the world. Um, similarly, there's people in South America that have very high, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, that have longevity. And so when they've uh, looked at their diets too, they've seen that it's, you know, very, it's not processed at all. It's very, you know, very diverse. Lots of fruits and vegetables, limited amount of meat. You know, that's, that's what seems to be um, the trick there. Yes. Uh, my question is, for cancer patients, my understanding with active cancer, that you can um, see higher levels of like long chain fatty acids and even a suppression of um, bile duct activity, sluggish bile duct. So if that's the case, is there a way beyond, I mean, clearly just eating the diet isn't enough. So what is a patient to do? Is there another step? Can you supplement in some way that's healthy to augment what your body is not able to do because of the cancer yeah. itself? Yeah, and so, you know, with each one of those things, this is what we have so far, right? This is the research that has happened so far. Um, but like I said, there are a lot of new products that are coming out. Um, that are gonna use these bugs as drugs or, you know, and so um, CBM 588 being one prime example of that. But that's, you know, that's a very niche, you know, kidney cancer, getting immunotherapy, you know, those are the patients who got benefit from that. And I think we have to realize that our bodies are incredibly complex. And so, you know, for each one of those situations, there could be a different, you know, solution to that. I don't think there's gonna be a one solution that fits everybody. I, I can tell you there is one solution that fits everybody, and that's what the doctors have been saying for 50 years, uh, which is, you know, eat fruits and vegetables, right? <laughs> um, even when they were smoking, right? They were still talking about fruits and vegetables. Yes? Um, how, how about the microbiome of the yogurt? How do you influence that? So um, fermented yogurts is the biggest thing that really can introduce lactobacillus there. Um, so that's, that's really the biggest thing. Um, there are studies that are going on to kind of uh, see if what you're eating, if that changes your pH, and if that you know, leads to a different kind of microbiome. Um, but the urine microbiome is, uh, very, is probably, you know, it's very, very young. 
um, because we didn't know that there was a microbiome there. Um, and so that's, you know, we don't know as much about that. Maybe it wants me to end the presentation. <laughs>
question online. Is anyone engaging in current research related to long-term vegetarians with a history of cancer with bad luck who have received a long hauler COVID diagnosis? With bad what? Luck who have received a long hauler COVID diagnosis. Okay, so that's a very specific situation. <laughs> um, so this is, so could you repeat again? So this is a person who might have had long COVID and are vegetarian. Long-term vegetarians with a history of cancer. Yeah. So the, to, and the question is? Is there anyone engaging in current research related to these people? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Um, but there are, you know, there's a lot of people working on this. Uh, this is, you know, um, I think we're learning more and more about, um, about vegetarianism as well as, you know, balanced diets that also incorporate some meats. Um, we're learning about a lot about that. Um, so there, there, there is going to be research about that in the future. I, I mean, even if I don't know about it, I'm sure there's going to be something about that. Uh, the future is hopeful. Yes, Jordan, you can clap. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, I, this doesn't want to work. Hello? Okay, a couple of final housekeeping things uh, before everybody goes. First, check your email uh, for a very brief conference survey. Um, our October meeting with Dr. Khan and Dr. K and Jamie Kelly and um, the rest of our group is to basically read over the comments that you've given us and to say, okay, well, this is what worked, this is what didn't work, this is what went really well and we want to hear more, this is what I'm thinking you didn't talk about at all and I really want to know about it. So we have plenty of opportunity each year to incorporate ideas and thoughts and critiques and feedback from what you've given us for this year. Um, so it's kind of my favorite meeting in a way. I like to hear what you guys have to say. So please um, send us some, some ideas. Um, speaking of, next year's date is set for September 19th, 2025, so we'll see you in a year. Uh, mark your calendar. And for those who signed up to receive continuing medical education credits, you should have received an email earlier this week with directions on how to claim credit. It will be resent to you on Monday for easy reference. Um, lastly, feel, please feel free to take a mum from the table, one per person, please, and leave the basket behind. Um, the shuttle will be... Uh, running a continuous loop between the Davis Center and Gutterson Garage until 4.30 p.m. And thank you all so much for coming. Um, this is one of our favorite proud moments of the year to, to put on this conference. And it's so great to spend a day with everybody. So thank you so much.